Welcome to the OmniTalk Ask an Expert series, the series where we go deep on the key trends with the people, the companies, and the technologies shaping the future of retail. I'm your host, Anne Mazinga, and in today's episode, we are talking all about the changing grocery landscape from the perspective of someone who is living it every day, and that is Chad Peterson, the Vice President of E-Commerce at Lowe's Foods. Chad, welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's busy and we're moving fast and furious, as they say, but uh, doing great. That's so funny. I was going to say, you know, it's been a pretty laid back year in grocery so far. You got, you've probably just been, you know, sliding right on through. Um, no, you have been so busy this year. Our listeners might recall from one of our Fast Five podcasts a couple of weeks ago, you guys were in that episode. We were talking about pickup lockers that you placed in an office building why don't you set the stage for us a little bit, Chad? We're in Minneapolis. We have listeners, though, throughout the country and the world. Tell us a little bit about you and about Lowe's Foods, just to give our, our listeners some context. So Lowe's Foods is a super regional grocer operating through the Carolinas, about 80 stores. And we've been around um, since the 1950s, started in uh, North Wilkesboro, actually, from part of the same family as Lowe's Home Improvement. We're not... Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, together as far as companies, but we actually recruit a lot from there and they recruit from, from us as well. Um, but uh, it's been an interesting journey. I think what drew me to the company was not just the opportunity, because um, it was hard to really tell from the outside how involved they were with e-commerce because I had never ordered groceries online before. Sure. And I think it was after I did some of the interviews and I did a store tour with our president, Tim Lowe, um, for those food stores are truly an experience. Um, we are all about growing community. That's what Lowe's Foods is all about. And when I got that yeah. tour and all the experiential elements in our store and to hear his passion, not just for uh, bringing kind of entertainment to life in our stores. And I mean, we do the chicken dance in our stores when, when hot fresh chicken comes out. Uh, we have beer dens. We were the first uh, store in the Carolinas to offer sip and shop. So our carts have cup holders. Um, we have community events at, a, at community tables at the heart of our stores. And then when he got to e-commerce, um, you know, his passion continued on. And to understand that Lowe's has actually been doing grocery pickup since 1997. So that was a oh. shocker. I had no yeah. idea. And most people don't know that. So I was fortunate to have the opportunity to step into a role where there was already a, kind of a lot of embracing of e-commerce and understanding of e-commerce, but they were still relatively, I think they were ready to make an evolution. And that's what we've been working on for the better part of, you know, three and a half years. And when the pandemic hit, it just accelerated the things we were already working on. So we were fortunate that we could react and respond um, to help the community and, and be there for the guests who needed delivery and needed pickup. Right. Uh, and we were able to pull hosts from within our store to help Lowe's Foods to go because we do pick from our stores. So it's been a very interesting indoctrination into the industry because I admit to everybody I'm not from grocery, but we have the majority of our hosts with Lowe's Foods are uh, from grocery at some point in their careers. Um, so to see the kind of um, fusion of a handful of us who don't come from the industry with a lot of folks who do, you know, we've, we've made some pretty positive strides there. Oh, I have to imagine. Well, especially with such a strong like legacy of having served online grocery ordering, you know, for, since 1997, I have to imagine, you know, there's people, you got well-oiled systems in place, um, so you're not, it's not completely foreign to you. Like it was for some retailers when the pandemic hit, but Chad, I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of bring us back to, you know, March, 2020, like bring us back to those early days of the pandemic. I know this is probably for some, it's like childbirth and they've forgotten. Some of us would don't want to go back to it at the time, but like, what were some of the things that you're like the first things that you were starting to turn on the first things that you were starting to activate with the team and kind of how you prioritize those um, and how that's continued throughout this past year. We had a good amount of um, work already in the pipeline as far as our staging areas and technology we were okay. using because our job in e-commerce is not just to supply the guest experience online, the native app, the e-commerce experience and kind of that digital realm, but it's also operational. So the technology that our hosts are using in their hands and the service protocols they use, the staging rooms, the equipment, the parking lot. So focusing on safety, how do you, how do you uh, 
start to run a quarter of your store's revenue through e-commerce when you're not accustomed to doing that much? Nice. And where, where do you store everything? But how do you keep your hosts separated so that we don't have a bunch of people running around in a small area where we stage the groceries? Where do you stage the groceries when you run out of room? So we were literally converting um, some of our boxcar coffee shops into makeshift staging rooms. And we were staging in the back of the store. Uh, stores really got creative. And of course, that was just the e-commerce aspect. Sure. Uh, the in-store experience had to change. Aisles had to go certain directions. And we had to shut down. You know, we were talking earlier about the experiential items at Lowe's Foods. We have a community table in most of our stores. That community table hosts events. And we have a community table manager whose responsibility is to run tastings and fundraisers and other events that you know are part of the community and part of the store well we couldn't run those so we had those hosts help us and we had to scale up our equipment we innovated in six months what would have probably taken us two years from a from a digital standpoint hardware and we came up with new new practices for staging groceries and getting them out the door um, that we still employ part of today so um but we had to put a blueprint out there because to make it repeatable across all of our stores, we, we had to guess, yeah. you know, we were sitting Trying on a whiteboard here. saying, all right, well, how do we keep these people separated? We literally called it kind of our, our blueprint and we guided our stores through it while they had a million other things to figure out as well, because everybody figured out e-commerce is exploding because people need it. And um, we were fortunate that within six or eight weeks of that initial um, thrust of the pandemic, we were back to, next day availability because we were able That's to scale up our capacity you know have the hosts in place have we we welcomed several hundred additional hosts as well to to those foods to go that is really incredible that is much much faster than i think a lot of the other stores in the nation were experiencing during the, during this last year and what i'm hearing from you is that you know that's a combination of breaking down the silos not being just you know an e-commerce team an in-store operations team and a tech team that you know, it sounds like you guys are all whiteboarding, creating this blueprint together. Are you still working that closely with all your teams as you start to think about, you know, what the kind of tech and store operations roadmap looks like for Lowe's for the next, you know, year to two years? Now that e-commerce is so much bigger, it's all the more important that we interconnect with all the pieces, not just of the store, but of our organization. So you think about distribution, um, supply chain, there's impacts from e-commerce because we're literally stealing off the shelves of the <laughs> store and IT and, and complex systems where we're trying to get more sophisticated uh, and not working in a silo anymore, but working as part of an enterprise. And that's a, that's a pretty big shift for grocers. Everybody listening would, would have to agree with you 100% there. Well, Chad, I want to tap you. You are our expert here. We're talking e-com grocery. Um, you partner with Shipt and Instacart in addition to your own Lowe's Foods to Go program. I want to go through and just kind of like break it down. There's been a ton of headlines lately with, you know, new players coming, Uber coming into the third party delivery game. We've got Instacart doing fulfillment. Now there are more than enough options for your entire store team <laughs> to be going through and analyzing. What are your thoughts on delivery or pickup grocery pickup? How do you guys think about that at Lowe's? It's, it's probably a little bit, um, Painted because we've been a pickup based service for the better part of coming on 25 years. So we introduced delivery five or six years ago in a very small way. Uh, we were accelerating it pre pandemic uh, and it's a much bigger part of what we do now. Um, again, talking about Lowe's foods to go kind of our own e commerce. Um, but I think pickup and even the trends are starting to show that um, pickup is accelerating again as people get back out and get back out in their cars sure. back into their stores. Um, we're going to continue to lean into delivery because I think people understand how convenient it is to get it delivered, but there's still the, um, the challenge of, of, um, having to pay a delivery fee in most cases, even with membership options out there. Right. Um, but I think for us, pickup fuels that relationship with the guest when the guest is pulling up, even though we've made it seamless, we use technology where you can literally let us know you're on their, uh, on your way through an app and when everything works digitally and mechanically. And from a human standpoint, our host can be outside waiting for you. That's incredible. That's but so great. Yeah. It, but it's kind of like returning to the office. There's still a magic 
in human interaction. So even if we're loading the trunk and talking to the guests through the trunk, offering them, you know, a, a little sample or a surprise and delight, whatever it might be. Um, I think people kind of crave that, but they still love the convenience of having had the grocery shop for them. So for me, I think my answer is pickup. Do you think that we'll start to see decline in delivery as a grocer? Are you like weighing your options there? I don't think delivery is going to decline. Uh, there's still going to be a heavy demand for it. I think the balance is going to shift maybe a little bit more heavily in favor of pickup just because of people getting back out and, um, so many people still still like going to their store, even if they're not coming into their store. It's an interesting right. interesting concept, and and you might not hear that from every grocer either. It's going to be different by by brand. Yeah, or you know, it's it's a hybrid approach where I do want to go pick out a special occasion cheeses or something, and then I, I but I don't need to get my staples. I know those are going to be ready, so I'll curbside pick up those on the way out. Let's talk about third party picking versus owned picking. That's an interesting one. It, it's that's going to depend on the retailer's strategy. Uh, it's going to depend on assortment. Um, and it's going to depend on how, how deep they want to go from a financial perspective, because picking your own groceries with your own labor is expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, there are pros and cons. We've been doing it, again, for a very long time. We've gotten really good at it, uh, finding the right people. And, uh, but other grocers rely completely on the third parties, and they're being just as successful. Um, so I, I think there's factors of, do you want to own the relationship with a guest? If you do, then you're generally doing your own. If you don't mind having that relationship owned by somebody else, but the sales come through you and your store, then third party works. One of the beauties of third party and one of the many reasons we, we partner um, with the other third parties, uh, Shipped and Instacart primarily, is that they do it all. So for those guests who want that really fast turnaround, um, there are some additional fees often associated in different membership constructs as well. Um, the guest might choose that path. And as long as those drivers and shoppers are providing the level of service that our partners you know, require of them, because uh, there's only so far a brand can go in, in being part of that experience. You know, Once we put the products on the shelves, the driver shopper from the third party is the guest. They're representing mm -hmm. the guest. So um, we do our best to support those shoppers when they're in the store. Um, and, you know, that's it's a good strategy there because there are people who only want to shop through the third party providers because they represent a number of different brands, not just grocery. But uh, you've seen the emergence of, you know, DoorDash getting, getting into the game and um, yeah. convenience stores and drug stores and things like that. So as that portfolio grows, I think it's important for those foods to be there so that when they, that when they want our products and our experience, they can get that through third party. So, so you're going to do a split. Is that what I'm hearing? You're splitting it or in, it depends between third party picking and own picking. Um, if we take or the financial constraints the out of it, my vote's going to be do it, do it the way we've been doing it for almost 25 years. <laughs> DIY. DIY. I like yeah. it. I think have a really good program that nurtures uh, growth and career opportunities for, for hosts. And you think about e-commerce, if, if you're doing that job at, at any grocer, you're learning about technology, you're learning about customer service, you're learning about food safety. You, you get to become a, a guru at the meat counter and sure. you know charcuterie and wines. <laughs> and I mean, you really are, at least in our program, you become a personal shopper because you're having to make some decisions for the guests make some recommendations. And often our guests tell our personal shopper on this item, you just make the choice, you know, choose sure. for me because you know me. So um, it takes a special kind of person to do that job as well. So um, I think the, the opportunity that we have to um, have other hosts in the store who are at the ready is uh, kind of a unique aspect for us. That's a, I did, I hadn't thought about that, Chad, but I think that's really important to point out. Um, and a big differentiator, you're right. You know, if I'm an Instacart or Uber driver and I'm picking up food or I'm picking up people or I'm picking up products from all kinds of retailers, you don't have that highly specialized, you know, I know that most people like, you know, if this cut of meat is out there, they'd prefer this one, or this would be the next one. Like you, you really don't get to get to be that high touch. And so it's like, it's another way of, you know, not being face to face with somebody in the store, but really being able to apply that same level of service, um, 
in a digital experience, which is even more important now to continue mm-hmm. to give people your Lowe's customers that confidence that their, their online order will be just as good as if they had gone in and picked it themselves. Well, I think the other challenge too for, for third parties, and of course, there's many that are figuring it out um, because they, they all have tremendously powerful technology that, that helps when you don't have the personal relationship and it, it can kind of do the, the, the thinking to help the shopper on behalf of their, their customer uh, be more successful. But you still have the challenge of these drivers are now lugging around groceries. It's different right. than going to get something from a restaurant. Um, or even a convenience store where it's a small order of a couple items. Groceries, you have to maintain cold chain. Sometimes you have to maintain warm chain. If you're, you know, getting a rotisserie chicken or a meal, you have 24 packs of bottled water. You have dog food. You have beer. Um, it's it's a complex order. And uh, as as the three PLs have grown and other services have raised their hand to say we'll do grocery as well, there's usually a learning curve because the first time a driver figures out that they're taking a thousand dollar order out to a coastal home or a mountain home that has two flights of steps and it's got, you know, 62 items in it. The there, there's kind of an aha moment there. And right. it's, that that's been a challenge with, with right. everybody um, leaning into that aspect of the industry uh, even more heavily over the last year, there's been a tremendous learning curve and not everybody can do it. And there's plenty of folks who can do it very well. So um it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a weeder course in, in college. There's some people who are kind of cut out for it and others who say, no, thanks. I'm just going to stick with, you know, driving people or, or doing small orders. And that's, that's what I like to do. Right. Well, that, that kind of is a tease, I think, for our next question, which is third-party delivery or own delivery. Um, I didn't realize that people would be drink, driving orders out to, you know, $1,000 orders up two flights of stairs to a coastal home. That sounds like, like you said, that is, uh, that is one thing that would separate the, the brave uh, from the weak, I think, from the weak, I think, when it comes to delivery. How, what are your thoughts on, on the, the third-party versus own delivery? Well, there is, uh, I guess, regardless of how your groceries are picked. So using, you know, those of us who do our own picking with our own personal shopping, we, we don't have our own fleets. So there's a significant capital investment liability insurance um, where everybody's kind of jumped into, uh, you know, let's outsource this. Let's go with a third party. And those third parties that have emerged that, that do the grocery last mile, some of them are the same ones who do the, the full aspect of the shopping and the delivery. So they're, they're better at it. Um, a number of logistics companies that had nothing to do with the grocery industry or the 3PL side for the kind of consumer uh, drive to home last mile, they've gotten into it and they're accelerating because they have the systems and the knowledge to create logistics networks and mm-hmm. the technology integrations required. Um, so Basically, last mile, 3PLs have really opened up the opportunity to mobilize groceries for most of us who, you know, have chosen not to do our own fleet. Now, with that, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to everything because those drivers don't represent Lowe's Foods or any grocer that they um, represent or they drive for. Um, they don't wear your uniforms. They don't necessarily represent your values. And that's one of the trade-offs. And uh, but it does allow us to mobilize groceries in an affordable context so that we can offer a delivery at a reasonable price because we still have to pay them, which means we still have to pass that fee along to the right. guest. And um, I think grocers are, are struggling with that a little bit, honestly, as things calm down a little bit to say, well, wow, grocery uh, delivery is a lot bigger than we mm-hmm. thought it might be. Well, Let's soul search a little bit. What do we want to do? And, and is 3PL working? If it's working and it's, it's good for the brand, it's good for the guest, then good. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of testing going on in the industry over the coming year to try different methods of transport, um, different endpoints, um, maybe testing some regional coverage on you know, the grocer doing it themselves and figuring out where is that uh, tipping point where it makes financial sense, but also sense for the brand. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, um, I wouldn't say shifting, but I think there's going to be a lot of testing going on in that kind of m- maybe swinging back toward the owned, but um, that's just kind of what it feels like at the moment. 
Okay. Yeah. I wonder too, you know, I think that there was this difference, like during the pandemic, it was, I, I just want to get my groceries. I don't care who's mm-hmm. dropped, like if they're not wearing a shifter Instacart uniform, if it's, you know, Uber, if it's the grocer themselves delivering it, like it's, it was about getting the product. But I, I wonder, you know, as you continue to test these kinds of things, as grocers continue to test, you know, how much that will change and, and will it be, you know, I want it faster. And so you're looking at, at more logistics centered, you know, 3PLs, or if you're looking at, you know, who's more highly branded, who's going to really represent um, you know, Lowe's Foods or my my grocery um, company because they you know they're talking to me when they drop it off. Like, how what are the the kind of exchanges that you you might have to look at there um, as you're testing some of these things? Do you do you have kind of a instinctual pull? It sounds like maybe owned delivery, but uh, for your customers at Lowe's, do you feel like they have a preference one way or another as they've kind of start to come out of this pandemic? It's a really good question. And I think the, the answer is we're not sure yet. So we are yeah. wholly into third party logistics providers and they've been doing a great job. And we've been, you know, we've we've grown our e com team to where we have folks who specialize in logistics and um, you know, kind of fleet management practices, even though we're not managing our fleet, there's a lot of those characteristics that have really helped yeah. us improve both the service and the integration and the performance with our, our partners. I think one of the things that you said, though, and I, I think there, there's a common um, mindset that everybody wants their grocery delivery faster. Whoever's going to do it the fastest is going to win. Sure. And I think there's a lot of data and in, insights emerging that um, as things settle down, quality is going to be more important than speed. People mm-hmm. will still pay to get the speed and they want, if they really need that grocery order within an hour, and there's plenty of cases where that's the case, then there are services out there that are going to do that. For a grocer picking in store, that's very difficult because if you were to offer a lot of capacity for one hour turnaround, you, and you'd have to cap the orders and you don't want to cap the orders because when people do delivery, they generally like to stock up. Um, so there's a very there's a very delicate balancing act. Um, I think what we're focusing on and many grocers are focusing on is how to drive that awareness about the fact that we we have delivery to begin with and make the turnaround time fair so that our mm. you know shopper can do the shop. We still get in touch with every guest or do our best to actually get we we still call our guests, believe it or not. So in the in the world of all the technology and all the advanced stuff we have, we still attempt to call the guest and we we need time for that and guests often like to say oh i forgot this this and this well we got to go back out and grab those things and we're more than happy to do that um but if if that guest wants an hour turnaround that's going to be difficult and it's probably going to put undue pressure on the system and you know we we can't necessarily have 20 personal shoppers available at the ready idle waiting for those orders to come in so right that um puzzle has been a constant struggle. Um, but again, there's plenty of services out there that can turn around groceries extremely fast. We wanna be able to offer that, but we're, we're kind of focusing in other areas, but getting delivery to our guests is, is kind of very foundational. Well, I think that's a great, that's another great point. Um, lot, so much of what you're saying, Chad, is such, a, such great insight from just the day-to-day workings of like how, yes, for us on the, on the customer side, it seems so simple. Like we're ordering, it's ready, it's coming to us, but there are so many things that have to take place. And I, I, I also think, you know, speed, yes, may become less important, but it's also, you know, catering to people in the right way at the right time in the right place. And one thing that we, we alluded to earlier was, you know, how you are starting to experiment with pickup lockers. And I, I love to get your thoughts on, you know, just what, what kind of, um, programs you're starting to pilot and how you think pickup rock lockers, um, play a role in kind of this evolution of, of grocery delivery and pickup. The technology is an enabler. Um, and at Lowe's, we, we've been serving, um, communities kind of well beyond individual households for several years. Um, cause everybody needs groceries. It could mm-hmm. be groceries for an office environment, a church event, uh, catering services, you know, we offer catering services. So as the pandemic has illuminated the, the trust in the mobilization of grocery, something like a series of temperature controlled lockers help us 
kind of mobilize that in a different way. So if a, a community or an organization says, we want to offer this benefit to our constituents, we'd love to be there because we know that we can handle the shopping and the, uh, the, the transport and the partnership. We're a locally owned company here in the Carolinas. So we'll go out and we'll meet with the businesses and, and work, with, work with them. But it comes down to those relationships. So there are many different form factors that our equipment can take or any grocer's equipment can take for that matter that can suit the needs of the relationship or the partnership. Anything else that you're seeing in, in like just, or that you're exploring um, as, as a grocer, as an e-com grocer right now that you think that people should be paying attention to in, in the grocery industry? Well, I think a, an overarching trend in grocery is the, um, the blend of grocery and food service. You're seeing this everywhere um, mm -hmm. where now that people are good with placing orders for groceries online, well, people are already good with placing orders with their restaurants online and their favorite apps. Um, many grocers are trying to figure out how do we bring more meal solutions to life and food service and, and prepared meals and um, a la carte meals, those types of things. So I think as a trend, um, instead of you know, the, the grocer handling their restaurant one way and their e-commerce for grocery another, you'll probably see some convergence there. And I think there's going to be a lot of focus um, in the coming 12 to 18 months on just writing the ship on the user experience side. I think the, the digital side for grocery has a ton of upside potential. Think about engagement, discovery, mm -hmm. um, inspiration, brand, bringing your brand back to life within yeah. that, what would often be a utilitarian enterprise of search for your groceries, put your milk and your eggs and your bread in your cart and check out. Well, right. it, it should be more than that. And every grocery is going to be different. Everybody's going to have a different approach at it. But um, I think we'll see a lot of investment on the digital side um, throughout the industry, because that, that might've been the part that was left behind as people just figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. I got to put a storefront up and I got to figure out how to pick and get the groceries to my guests safely. I'm not worried about what it looks like. But I know I think right. there's gonna be a lot of let's fix that part. Yeah. And how the brand partners and CPG companies are kind of taking this new online version or really mobile version of their, their store um, mm -hmm. instead of the shelf talkers and, you know, end caps that they were working on now, how do you kind of get to know the shopper and, you know, really work with the grocer to benefit that shopper, to give them the best possible experience, but from a mobile device uh, in this case, more likely than, you know, a shopping cart in some instances. Um, well, you know, you mentioned CPGs. Um, one of the unique things about CPGs that, that has really been exciting, especially for us on the e-com side, is um, the pandemic really motivated the CPGs, some of whom might not have been as engaged on the e-com side. They're very engaged now. And e-com adds a whole new portfolio to their opportunity to move product and bring their product into that discovery. And e-commerce gives you the ability to promote products in different ways and use different online services to get that portfolio promoted. So um, we've really leaned into our CPG partnerships, uh, sure. both at the national level and at the local level. Uh, and there's, there's a whole host of opportunity there as well. And, you know, cause again, we want it to be a win-win both for us and our vendor partners. Um, so that we can get the guests what they need, but continue to drive the sales. Because again, you need the sales to keep the kind of engine going. Well, Chad, I have, I have a, just a couple last questions to ask you here. The first one is, you know, as we go back to the, the headlines that have been in the news lately, um, you know, looking at Instacart, for example, coming in and now saying we, we can do fulfillment for you. Um, in store, we'll we'll partner partnering with you to do micro fulfillment centers. We can, you know, have another delivery provider that is, as you mentioned, you know, they can deliver your your hardware store items and your grocery items all in the same order. As we start to look at these things, what is your where do you kind of come down in your final like question um, that grocers might be asking themselves of? you know, do we buy our own system? Do we invest in building that internally or do we find a partner? Where do you kind of, what would your advice be for grocers who are listening to this? What do you want to be when your e-commerce grows up? So we are, we are always evolving. We are never sitting still. I don't think any grocer is. Mm -hmm. And now that the dust is settling a little bit and, you know, the Instacart news is just one of many disruptions in the marketplace. And, 
since I've gotten here three and a half years ago, it's, it's been in constant flux. It's like the weather, right? Just wait five minutes and it'll change. So first and foremost, I think any grocer who's really committing to e-com has to figure out what do you want it to be within your portfolio? What do you want it to be experientially, first and foremost, before you worry about the how, because that says a lot about, I mean, that can help you make your decision if you're going to have your own shoppers pick or you're going to rely on outsourcing. Um, while keeping a very broad view into what's going on in the market. So how are robotics being employed? How are micro fulfillment strategies being employed? How and when are dark stores being employed? Where are they successful? Where are they not? Mm. Um, you know, we've seen more acceleration in those strategies, but dark stores, micro fulfillment, those have been around for five, six, seven years. And um, some grocers have adopted those strategies and some of the bigger grocers are able to go with some of the robotics and automation and those types of things, but it's still very early adoption phase. I think the, the average regional grocer, independent grocer, super regional, doesn't matter unless you're one of the major grocers, it's still a lot of test and learn. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be some cases where you build your own and there's going to be some cases where you buy or you outsource. It's, it's truly a portfolio of systems, technology, platforms, consulting partners, um, capital investments, um, outsourced work, could be for your picking, could be for your driving, all the things we, we talked about. So it's a constant juggling act. And our portfolio looks different now than it did three months ago. And it's going to look different three months from now than it looks today. And um, every bit of news that comes out is interesting because it kind of fuels the mind to say, well, what's going on there? Why did they choose that path? Have we thought about that path? Does that make sense for us? But you got to stay true to your roots. Right. And it's That's... easy when you're, when, when you're on the tech side to just react and say, shiny penny, shiny penny. And I think anybody doing e-commerce, not just grocery, has to have the discipline to say, what is our strategy and how does this fit into a broader picture? Yeah. And if there is a pivot, what make, when and where does that pivot make sense? And, and like you said, the investment of time, of people, um, of money into those, those pivots, um, it's pretty significant. Grocery is a very personal Food is a very personal thing. So in this part of the business, when you just look myopically at, a, at the moment for e-commerce, um, we, are, we are helping people help other people. And I think that gets lost because e-commerce news is all about, and we've talked about plenty of great things, technology and third-party logistics and websites and strategies, and, but nothing happens without the people. Yeah, there's robotics out there and the robotics are going to help um, certain, certain grocers, but this is a very personal thing. Food is personal. Um, we're, we're picking groceries for people's meal tonight. Right. And so, um, I think we forget all too often that human factor and making sure that we're investing in those people and supporting them, um, whether they're our own employees or we're assisting our three PL, you know, drivers and shoppers who come into our stores because they, they, at the end of the day are taking those items to families. As you think about the next year and, and as you're trying to progress the team at Lowe's Foods, I think that's a great example of how you can be a better grocer. Is there anything else that comes to mind as you guys are really trying to strive to be, you know, in a better spot a year from now? Things have settled down. We're taking a breath. Our, our teams have changed. Uh, in our case, our team has grown. E-commerce is a bigger deal. It's a bigger part of the company. So now, we can soul search again, back to what we were talking about earlier to say, how does this fit? Let's not be as reactive now. Let's start thinking about the future and where do we want to go? And what is, let's remember how to plan things and let's, let's remember how to charter our projects and let's remember to have steering committees. So we have buy-in and we have cross organizational support and let's look more broadly through the enterprise at the things we're thinking of and how they fit in so that we're marching forward together. So it, it's just kind of almost re remembering how to run a team and run a business in a proactive planned manner um, because things at the end of the line will be numerous. It'll be the technology, it'll be the people aspect, it'll be the innovation and the systems and the partnerships and all that. But now we get to choose how to move forward starting from this, what I call the, the next normal, this, this new base that we're all uh, building from. Chad, that was so great. Thank you so much for being with us today. If people are listening to this, they want to get in touch with you. They want to learn more about Lowe's Foods. What's the best place for them to go to do that? 
Um, they can uh, just reach out to Lowe's Foods Guest Services and um, we have their phone number um, and website posted, but they can always visit Lowe'sFoods.com. It's a tremendous online experience to get a flavor for what we do. And the best, best way to experience Lowe's Foods is through our, our stores throughout the Carolinas and uh, you can have a chance to do the chicken dance next time you're in the store. I will be, that is on my list now. I, I must see that, or I have to look up, hopefully there's like a YouTube video or something I can find from, from the Absolutely story. Absolutely captured on Instagram sure or can. something. Well, thank you so much, Chad, for joining us. That is Chad Peterson, the vice president of e-commerce at Lowe's Foods. And we say it every week, be careful out there.